part today in seminar and we are happy to have Pirit Busov from University of Georgia, uh, quivers, flow trees and log curves, so please. Okay, so thank you very much for the invitation to speak at the seminar. So yeah, today I will talk about quivers, flow trees, and lockers. It's a joint work with the Argus, which is available, available on the archive since a few months. Okay, so in this talk, I will describe a connection between, on one side, so-called Donaldson-Thomas invariance, of quivers so there are numbers which are algebraic counterpart of Donaldson and Thomas invariance counting geometric objects in the context of Calabio three force and I would explain a connection between this topic and a pretty different topic involving some version of gram of Witten counts of rational curves in toric varieties. Okay, and the connection between these uh, two topics will be somewhat indirect and we'll go through uh, some kind of intermediate uh, combinatorial step. So essentially on the Donaldson Thomas uh, side, there will be a wall crossing story whose combinatorics can be captured by flow trees, by some appropriate trees. And the point will be that these flow trees can be reinterpreted in terms of tropical curves. And then uh, these tropical curves will be a tropical version of the algebraic curves counted on the gram of Whedon side. So this kind of a basic picture, in particular, the connection between Donaldson and Thomas invariants and these flow trees, their wall crossing, and the fact that they should be viewed as tropical curves is suggested in a paper by Konsevich and Silberman around 2013. And what I will describe is a specific example where one can prove uh, something. And in particular, what is maybe interesting is a precise description of this count of curves here. So as I will try to explain, they are not the most standard kind of gram of Whedon counts. And so it, I will need to spend some time describing what are these counts. And some of the main uh, technical result in our paper is proving this correspondence, proving a tropical correspondence theorem between uh, this count of curves and appropriate counts of tropical curves. Okay, but for, uh, to set the stage, I will start by talking about uh, this direction, the left-hand side, the Donaldson Thomas uh, invariant side of the story. And then in the second part of the talk, I will uh, explain uh, this connection. Okay, so it's a rough plan. So let me uh, set up uh, some uh, notation. So we'll be considering a quiver, which for us will always be some finite oriented graph of finitely many vertices. And for each pair of vertices, I have a finitely many arrows between them. Maybe this thing is a quiver. I will denote by Q uh, such a quiver. And once you have a quiver, there is a notion of representation of a quiver and a representation will be a collection of vector spaces that will always be assumed to be finite dimensional complex vector spaces vi for each vertex i for each vertex i in the quiver you give yourself a finite dimensional vector space and for each arrow alpha in the quiver connecting a vertex i to a vertex j you want a linear map from the vector space VI to the vector space VJ. Okay, so it's a notion of representation of a quiver. And representations of the quiver form a nice 
abelian categories there's a natural notion of morphism of uh, between quiver representations uh, alternatively the category of quiver representation you can think about it as a category of modules of a natural associative algebra constructed out of the quiver and what we'll care about are moduli spaces of such a representation so there is a basic a discrete invariant. If you have a quiver representation, you can look through its dimension vector, which is a collection of the dimension of the vector spaces attached to the various uh, vertices. So it's naturally, so it's a collection of integers it, living in the lattice, I will always denote by N, which contain a copy of Z for each vertex in the quiver. It's the lattice with a basis uh, EI, uh, where I uh, or run over vertices of the queer. And so if I fix an element a vector gamma in N, I can try to look at the space of all possible quiver representations of each dimension gamma up to isomorphism. And this thing is quite uh, easy uh, to describe. By a definition in a quiver representation, I have a linear map for each arrow. So for each uh, arrow alpha going from i to j, I need to give me a linear map from a vector space of dimension gamma i to a vector space of dimension gamma j, where gamma i has a component of gamma. But I am considering a representation up to isomorphism. So you need to divide this big vector space by an action of a group, which is the product of a general linear group uh, attached to the vertices. Okay, so this thing is a set of quiver representation. It's naturally such quotient. And so from an algebra geometric point of view, this set of all possible representation is naturally uh, an algebraic stack. And if we want to extract more reasonable algebra geometric objects, such as an algebraic varieties, we need to pick a notion of stability for quiver representations, and then uh, restrict ourselves to moduli space of stable representations. So I will need to introduce a notion of stability, and I will only consider King's notion of stability. So I will uh, consider the real vector space MR, which is the dual of the lattice N. So linear map from N to R. So this thing is just some d-dimensional real vector space if D is the number of vertices in uh, my quiver. And if I fix an element gamma in N, which is lattice of dimension D, I can consider the dual hyperplane gamma perp. So the set of theta in MR, so that the set of gamma is zero. This thing is some hyperplane inside the real vector space. And the point in this hyperplane will define me a notion of stability for quiver representations of dimension gamma. If I have V, a, dimension, a representation of dimension gamma, We'll say that V is theta semi-stable if theta of dimension of V prime is less or equal to zero for every V prime sub-representation of V. Okay, so in the usual way, the notion of stability constrains the possible sub-objects that we are considering. And now there is a nice uh, construction essentially by geometric invariance theory. You can uh, cook up a moduli space M gamma theta, which is a moduli space of theta semi stable representation of uh, dimension gamma. And this thing now is no longer uh, stacks, it's an honest uh, quasi projective variety.
Okay, it's actually projective if the quiver has no oriented cycles. And if there are oriented cycles, there is a way to enrich the story by considering so called potential. So if oriented cycles, you can pick a so called potential W, which is a formal linear combination of oriented cycles. And then you can use this a formal expression to cook up a regular function on the modulus spaces of representations. Essentially, if you have a representation, you have a collection of linear maps attached to the various uh, arrows. And if you have an oriented cycle, you can uh, compose these uh, linear maps to get an endomorphism. And then you can take the trace of this endomorphism and you produce a number. And that's why you produce regular functions on your moduli spaces. And now the Donaldson Thomas invariance of the of the quiver with the X-ray data of the potential if the oriented cycle is a virtual count of critical points of a cis functional on the modi space of theta stable representation. Okay, so it will be some integer. I will denote like that. It depends on a choice of gamma, a choice of a dimension vector, and a choice of stability parameter theta. And one way to describe it is as being the order characteristic, topological order characteristic of the modi space of semi stable representations valued in some appropriate uh, sheaf, which is obtained by taking the vanishing cycle functor for the function trace w, applied to the intersection commonly sheaf on the moduli space m gamma theta. Same so thing in some integers. Okay, so here there are various technicalities. If the moduli space is smooth, and if the potential is zero, this thing is simply the order characteristic, topological order characteristic of the moduli space. And if the moduli space happens to be singular, you use the intersection cohomology shift rather than the constant shift. And you take into account the potentials through the vanishing cycle function. Okay, so this thing are the integers that we'll care about, which are extracted from the topology of moduli spaces of quiver representations. And we can work with some rational version of this number. I will denote by omega bar, gamma theta, which are obtained by some kind of multiple cover formula. You sum over all the way to a gamma as a multiple of another gamma prime in n. So where gamma is some integer. And then there is a factor minus one over k minus one divided by k squared times omega gamma prime theta. And this thing are rational in general. And this formula can be inverted. So knowing all the omegas or knowing all the omega bars are equivalent. Okay, so this is Donaldson Thomas invariance of quivers originally have been introduced by a Conservy Sommerman, Joyce and Song, Reinecker, and uh, in, in, using a slightly a different definition based on the motivic whole algebra. And what I'm describing here is the way I introduce them is some kind of alternative description due to Meinhardt Heinecke and Davison uh, Meinhardt. Okay, so we care about these numbers. So these numbers depend on the discrete parameter gamma, and they depend on the continuous parameter theta, because theta lives in this uh, real hyperplane inside a real vector space. So theta live inside some real vector space. And there is a natural uh, wall crossing story which controls the dependence with respect to theta. So there is some wall crossing story on how the numbers about the dependence with respect to theta. Roughly, this is a real hyperplane 
is divided into various uh, chambers. And as long as theta uh, stay into one chamber, this is integer omega gamma theta uh, stay constants. But when you go from one chamber to another, uh, the moduli spaces uh, will change. Object which was stable will become unstable and vice versa. So the topology of the moduli space will change and these numbers uh, will also change. And so the places where this thing is happening are exactly the places where these hyperplanes gamma perp intersect other hyperplanes. So they form gamma or different gamma prime, maybe gamma prime perp. Okay, if I take gamma gamma prime, gamma perp is one hyperplane, gamma prime is another hyperplane. If they are distinct, they will intersect along a codimension two locus, which is of codimension one inside gamma perp. And it is while crossing this codimension one loci that in gamma perp, then you can have this wall crossing behavior. Okay, and the wall crossing happening is controlled by universal wall crossing formula. You do a conservation. And what I will uh, describe now is how to use this wall crossing formula to uh, rewrite the general DT invariance, omega gamma theta, in terms of a simpler uh, uh, invariance in general called attractor invariance. So we will uh, reconstruct all DT invariance from simpler attractor DT invariance. And to define these attractor invariants, I need some uh, extra uh, notation. So remember that I have my quiver with D vertices. I have my lattice N of dimension D containing the possible vector dimensions. I have the dual real vector space RD. And out of the combinatorics of the graph of the quiver, you can define a skew symmetric form on the lattice N, such that if you uh, apply it to two basis element, EI and EJ, corresponding to the vertices I and J, uh, this uh, skew symmetric pairing is equal to AIJ minus AJI, where AIJ is a number of arrows from I to J uh, in the quiver. Okay, so roughly the skew symmetric version of the adjacent symmetrics of the graph of the quiver. And once uh, you have this skew symmetric form, you can use it to produce natural point for every gamma. So if you fix gamma, a dimension vector, you can produce uh, some kind of canonical point inside the upper plane gamma perp simply by evaluating this Q symmetric form on gamma. Okay, gamma was a Q symmetric form. I take gamma in the first entry, I use that as a linear function of the second entry. So it lives in uh, the dual vector space MR. And actually it's naturally a point inside this upper plane gamma perp because uh, gamma gamma is zero by skew symmetry. So from this Q-symmetric form, inside each upper plane's gamma perp, which is a space of stability parameters for representation of dimension gamma, I have a natural point, which is given by uh, this Q-symmetric form evaluated at gamma. And this point, I will call it the attractor point. And I will call attractor invariant the DT invariant obtained by taking the stability parameter equal to this attractor point. And I will simply denote by omega gamma star uh, this invariant. Okay. 
maybe I can uh, briefly stop there and ask if there are any questions. Okay, I do have two questions. Uh, yes. Firstly, the M uh, theta gamma. Yes. Uh, is that, are you taking the quotient by the group or? Yes. Yeah, so modular it, space or just the still uh, pre quotient? Yeah, so this modular space is- Oh, that's modular space. So taking the quotient with- the, Yeah, it's taking the quotient and thanks to the stability, the quotient is really taken in the GIT sense. Okay, okay. And uh, yeah, so it's really a GIT quotient. Uh -huh. And the second with the new, uh, with the respect to the quadratic form, uh, the skew symmetric form, yes. you have this a gamma. And uh, so what happens if I have uh, two representations taking the, Extraction, so that means the dimension vectors will be ha will have to be added. Uh, how how does this stability condition and this modular space change? Yeah, so maybe I will say something about that in one minute. Maybe while okay, good, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so for each gamma, there is some kind of canonical point in the space of stability parameters and uh, call the corresponding invariant attractor invariant. And the point of considering this particular invariant is that they are often, in many cases, not always, but often they are, they are very simple. For example, if the quiver is acyclic, if there is no oriented cycles inside the quiver, then these attractor invariants are extremely simple. They are equal to zero if gamma is not one of the basis uh, vectors and is equal to one if gamma is one of the basis vectors. So they are extremely simple. That is essentially zero or one. Uh, if you try to uh, consider yes. the geometric. Yeah, so the actually my next analog of this so then for non-compact uh, Calabi-Yaws, it's probably will be the same as for quivers with potential, but for compact calabi it can be probably arbitrary integer numbers. Yes, exactly. Sorry. Yes, exactly. The point is that we expect these numbers to be simple for things like non-compact Calabio, but they can be extremely complicated for things related to compact Calabios. Mm -hmm. yeah, yes, exactly. And actually, I was just going to mention this example for a non-compact Calabio threefold. For example, if X is a toric Calabio threefold, then in this case, you can produce a quiver with potential, which reproduce the DRF category of current sheaves on the toric Calabio threefold. And in this case, there is a conjecture. Let me say Moskovoy Fulin, which exactly says what Jan just suggested. So for non-compact Calabio threefold, you might expect these things to be very simple. And the precise conjecture is that this number is uh, all zero if uh, gamma is different from EI and if gamma is not in the kernel of this Q uh, symmetric form. And actually, there is a Precise version of the conjecture, which is exactly what they should be if gamma is in the kernel of the skew symmetric form. And actually, yeah, I can mention that actually this conjecture has been proved in a single case for like for local P2, particular toric Calabio threefold. It's, uh, it's somewhere in some work with uh, Decomp. The flock and purely in some paper we wrote about uh, local P2. And uh, as a corollary, we prove this uh, conjecture. And it did, as Jan said, the expectation is that these numbers are still complicated for things related to the compact LBO3 flock. Okay, so in general, a compact Calabi threefold probably has no quiver description, but maybe there is a pieces of the category which has a quiver description and these numbers can still be uh, complicated or expected to be complicated.
Okay, so in some cases, uh, they are simpler. In some other cases, they might still be complicated. But in all cases, you can reconstruct the general DT invariants, omega, gamma, theta, in terms of this uh, attractor invariant. It's essentially an application, iterative application of the wall crossing formula. And you will find a formula which has the following shape. So a general DT invariant for a stability parameter theta will be a sum over all possible decomposition of gamma into gamma one plus gamma r, and then a sum of a tree that I will, about which I will say more in one minute, some coefficient depending on this tree, and then some product of uh, attractor invariants omega gamma i star for the various gamma i appearing in the various uh, decompositions of gamma. And, and what we'll care about are these coefficients here. So here we have some kind of uh, universal uh, coefficients, which are some uh, integers. And so how to uh, understand this formula, you can understand in some kind of picture way you start in the upper plane gamma perp, you care about object of uh, uh, dimension gamma. You care about a particular point here, which is a particular stability theta. And here, what you can do is starting from this point, you can try to move toward the direction of the attractor point. So you can move in the direction given by these elements. This element is a vector in M containing this upper plane. So you can just move following this direction. And sometimes, you might eat a wall. So for example, the wall might be a place where another upper plane gamma one perp intersect gamma perp, maybe another upper plane gamma two perp intersect, maybe a third one gamma three perp intersect. So that gamma is equal to the sum of gamma one plus gamma two plus gamma three. And then uh, your initial uh, path starting from theta moving in the direction given by skew symmetric form, you can continue it in several ways. And you can continue it inside the upper plane gamma one perp by moving in the direction corresponding to gamma one. Or you can also uh, move it in the upper plane gamma two perps in the direction corresponding to gamma two or continuing the upper plane gamma three, perhaps moving in the direction corresponding to gamma three. And essentially, uh, and then you iterate, later and later upper planes, you can eat other walls, and then you get uh, these kind of trees. And in the formula, you essentially need to sum over all possible such picture, all possible uh, such trees. And mm -hmm. each, each such a tree will have some contribution, which essentially come from applying the wall crossing formula to each of the vertices of these trees. And it is how this number is uh, obtained. So for uh, mm, uh, uh, local Calabias, which correspond to uh, mm, Hitchin integrable system. So the base should be thought as a space of stability uh, structures on, on the Fukaya category uh, of yes. the Calabial threefold obtained from the spectral curve. And so this picture just becomes what we discussed with Maxim like in 10 years. Yes, exactly. Yes. Mm -hmm. okay. yeah, so, exactly. So, you think it's some kind of like local picture? If you are to point where there is some kind of uh, maybe quiver description, and if like locally uh, integrable system is just some trivial torus vibration, and then locally you will get such picture. 
yeah and you start uh, with uh, the thing which i do not quite understand for quivers it seems to be simple i mean if you start with uh, kind of a general i recall that uh, we had some um, problems with the behavior the discriminant so for the type a singularity when uh, when um when you have uh, when you uh, consider the smooth part of the discriminant kind of uh, the, the divisor yes smooth, smooth component yeah all right so then your gamma uh, gamma correspond to the vanishing cycle on yes. on 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 the on 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 the uh, mm, well say a billion variety uh, mm, approach in the discriminant but if you have more complicated uh, type of singularities is it still that simple yes yeah, mm. so so yes yeah, so no, i'm not making any assumption about that because i'm not saying anything about what the attractor environments are so somehow in this picture the discriminant locus is at infinity and maybe it has some contribution which can be arbitrary and I only care about uh, the coefficients which are used to reconstruct from these initial data the general things. I'm not saying yeah, anything yeah. about the yeah, yeah, how yeah, to yeah. determine the initial things. Yeah, yeah, I understand. So initial are arbitrary. Yeah. Ah, okay. Yeah, I recall that for type A, they are very simple. They yeah, for like type A, that you wrote one. from zero one. Yeah. Yes. Uh -huh. Yes. Exactly. Uh -huh, okay. Good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's why in some way it is what will happen. It's, it's like analog to what in some ways it's like a cyclic quiver case. It in some way here's yeah, like like here. Mm -hmm. yeah. In some way it will really be true that actually in this example, you can really yeah, like cook up a corresponding cluster variety in which there will be singular torus fibers, which would just be of type A. Which will exactly reproduce is very simple initial data zero and one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's and what we call the initial data. And yes, that, yes, exactly. yeah, okay. And you have some inductive construction and explicit formula for this F T theta, probably that's yeah, that's why this is numbers. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the main point of yeah, so that's so this old picture is as in your uh, paper. So the main point of our paper and my talk is to uh, give some enumerative interpretation of these coefficients, which are used in this kind of algorithm to reconstruct invariants from the initial data. Okay, so I will start talking about that now. So again, I fix uh, the quiver. So I have my latest n. With the basis EI, I have this Q symmetric form on it. I fix a dimension vector and I fix the decomposition gamma one plus gamma r. And I want to, so our goal is to uh, interpret these uh, universal coefficients coming from iteratively applying the wall crossing formula as some kind of gram of return environments. So as counts of rational curves. And in our case, it will be in a toric varieties. So I need to explain uh, what kind of toric varieties am I considering and what kind of rational curves are we counting? Okay, so the basic uh, motivation uh, for having such interpretation is the fact that these trees uh, looks a lot like tropical curves. So some kind of tropical limit of uh, complex algebraic curves. And so you might hope that they really correspond to some honest count of complex algebraic curves somewhere. Okay, so I need to introduce some toric variety and we'll consider a toric variety which has a fan 
inside the real vector space MR. So this is MR where this is dual vector space where stability parameters are living. It's some d-dimensional real vector space. And inside uh, this real vector space, we have particular rays. We have particular rays, which are the rays spanned by these uh, vectors. So obtained by putting gamma i in the first entry of this Q symmetric form. So by these attractor directions. So this construction depends on the choice of splitting of gamma into gamma one plus gamma r. And now for each gamma i, I look to the thermal corresponding attractor directions. And I uh, look at the corresponding ray span by this direction. And what I'm doing is that I will just take any fan, so take any fan sigma in um, R, which let's say for technical reason, I will always take, so let me write smooth projective fan, meaning it corresponds to a smooth projective variety, toric variety, and then containing the rays corresponding to the gamma i's. Okay, so here there are some choices. The minimal thing that I want is my fan to contain the various rays. So if I do some two-dimensional picture in R2, I have this various point gamma one, gamma two, gamma three, and I want a fan containing these rays. And and I have choices. I can always refine the fan if I want uh, the final result to be somewhat independent of these extra choices. But for example, if I want to get a very nice geometry, smooth and projective, I can always achieve that by adding uh, enough extra coils. Okay, so that way I produce X sigma, some D dimensional toric variety, where D was the number of vertices of the quiver. So it is a toric variety, so it's a porous equivalent compactification of C star to the D. And so it is C star to the D where we have added some normal crossing divisors. So let me denote by boundary of X sigma, the union of the toric divisors. Toric divisors correspond to rays in the fan. And so among these toric divisors, I have a special one which correspond to this gamma i. So among them, I have a particular toric divisors, the i corresponding to the rays spanned by skew-symmetric form evaluated on gamma i. Okay, so maybe on this picture, maybe here is some divisor D1, maybe here is some divisor D2, maybe here is some divisor D3. And the last piece of notation I need to set up the enumerative problem is to introduce for every i some hypersurface hi inside the, div inside the divisor di, which is an hypersurface with an equation of the following form z to the power gamma i divided by the lattice index of gamma i in n plus c i restricted to d i equal to zero. And this thing is an hypersurface in d i. So this thing is hypersurface in d i. And d i was itself a boundary divisor. So this thing is really co-dimension two in the full toric uh, variety. So for example, here on this two dimensional picture, uh, the di are just curves and the hi would just be points. So here we'll have maybe h1, h2, h3. And if I draw some more interesting picture, maybe some kind of three dimensional picture, 
in uh, some kind of so in emotion three my divisors will be various uh, surfaces and then uh, these hi will be various curves contained into these surfaces so maybe there will be some h1 here some h2 here so i don't know maybe some h3 here so will will you impose some intensity conditions in this hi like gross yes control? exactly yes okay. so indeed so uh, what we'll do so what so we'll consider curves in this geometry and we'll consider rational curves so let me introduce a moduli space um gamma maybe i'll you know by gamma with a narrow tuple of gamma one to gamma r and okay so it's a moduli space of rational curves so let me say genus zero with r plus one mark points to our rhetoric variety x sigma and the first of all we will ask that the only intersection points of this curve with the toric boundary is at the mark points p1 to pr plus one so we'll assume that the pre-image of the toric boundary is exactly the collection of point p1 pr pr plus one And in addition, we'll ask the point PI to belong to the codimension two locus HI. So for every I between one and R. And indeed, we'll add the tendency at PI along the divisor DI is given by the divisibility of this element in the lattice M. So, so gamma I live in N, and I apply this Q symmetric form, I get a point in the dual lattice M. And what I denote by bar is the divisibility of this element in the lattice. So I want this thing to be the contact order of my curve with a divisor di. If this thing is one, I want a transverse intersection. If this thing is two, I want a tangent. And if it's higher, I want tangent of higher order. Okay, so really the picture of curves in seismology spaces, they are uh, things like that maybe. So here I have a point P1 going to H1, here I have a point P2 going to H2, a point P3 going to H3, and I always have an extra mark point, PR plus one, which goes somewhere to the toric boundary, but I not, but the position of this last mark point is not fixed. Okay, so we have a moduli space of such rational curves in our toric variety. And we can check that the expected dimension of this moduli space is equal to D minus two. If D is a dimension of vertices in the quiver or the dimension of our toric variety. So in general, these curves move in D minus two dimensional uh, families. Are there any questions about uh, the this geometry and the kind of curves we're looking at? Um, yeah, can I ask in this toric setup, yeah. what's the ambient space for the wall crossing? Is that in the secondary fan or? Yeah, so E actually is a. I mean, these trees, the tropical curves, we really live simply in the fan of these the toric variety, the ordinary fan. Okay. Um, also, can I ask, uh, do the HI depend on the irrelevant ideal? Is that giving this co-dimension two information? Yeah, I don't know what do you mean by irrelevant. All uh, right, that's okay. 
Yeah, so so here the HI just, I mean, actually, they're just given by some explicit equation. Here there are some constants which are arbitrary. I just pick them generically. And the answer will be independent of these generic choices. But there are some very, some very simple like things. There are some explicit equations. Okay, thanks. Okay, so here the main point is that we need to do something somehow if D is bigger or equal than two. Okay, so somehow if D equal two, for example, this kind of problem has been considered by Gross, Pandey, Pandey, Zibert. In the tropical vertex paper, and roughly if d equal two, there are there are only finitely many of such curves, and you can just count them and get the number. But the whole point of what we're doing is that we care about d bigger or equal than two. So now this moduli space has a non-zero dimension, and something very much related is moduli space, as I have described it, is non-compact. Okay, so I'm gonna. Okay, because I'm assuming that my curves only touch the boundary in finitely many points. But when the curve moves in a D minus two dimensional family, it could be that in the limit, my curve, for example, fall entirely into the toric boundary. And then this condition to a finitely many intersection points with prescribed a contact order uh, is no longer valid. Okay, so what we really need is some compactification of this moduli space where we allow the curve to go into the boundary. So we want some nice compactification. I will denote M bar gamma. And the point is that there is such a nice compactification as a moduli space of a stable log maps in the sense of Abramovich chain and gross average. Okay, so the theory of stable log maps is a theory which exactly address this question. If you have a target variety with a normal uh, crossing divisor, and if you care about curves having a finitely many intersection points with this divisor with various specific uh, tangency conditions, in general, this moduli space will not be uh, proper because your curve might degenerate into the divisor. And you might ask, how do you? Actify it so that you get still nice properties similar to the nice properties of the moduli space of stable maps. And there is one way to do that using logarithmic geometry, which is moduli space of uh, stable log maps. So the key point is that this thing is really proper. And I will not go into the technical definition of this moduli space. I will just try to make a picture of it, assuming that everything is as nice as possible. So virtually, this moduli space M bar, M bar gamma really has dimension D minus two. And virtually, it's really some kind of normal crossing compactification of our original moduli space. So here I'm drawing similar picture to the one I was drawing for the toric variety, but now it's a different. The picture has a different meaning. I'm really drawing the moduli space of curves. And so I have some open part consisting of all the curve intersecting nicely the toric boundary. But then to compactify this moduli space, I need to add various divisors where the curve is falling inside the, the boundary. And uh, what we want to understand are essentially the various strata 
inside the stratification induced by these divisors compactifying the moduli space of curves. So more precisely, each time you have some kind of normal crossing space, you can understand the essentially the combinatorics of the intersection of these various strata by considering the corresponding dual intersection complex. which is an abstract cone complex which consists of a standard cone r non-negative to the power k for each co-dimension k stratum in uh, the stratification induced by this various normal crossings divisor. Okay, so if I draw the corresponding cone complex on this picture, I will have an origin corresponding to the open part. I will have various rays corresponding to the various uh, divisors. And on this picture, I will have various two dimensional cones corresponding to the various zero dimensional strata of my normal crossing compactifications. Okay, so if I was going to do that for my toric variety with toric boundaries, by this construction, I will simply reproduce the fan of the toric variety. But now I am doing it for the moduli space of curves, which in general has no reason to be toric, but still I can form this abstract uh, cone complex. And the claim is that this cone complex has a natural map to another cone complex which is a moduli space of tropical curves. So generically, we're looking to rational curves, maybe just P1 with a bunch of mark points going to our toric variety and intersecting the boundary nicely like that. But in the boundary of our moduli space, things can become much worse. Our rational curve can break into many components. And then some of these the components can map inside the divisor. They can be contracted. They can be uh, interact with the toric boundary divisor in a very complicated way. And the combinatorics of what is happening is again encoded by dual intersection complex. You can consider the dual intersection complex of the curve, meaning you consider one vertex for each component, one edge for each node. You really form some kind of abstract graph. The dual intersection complex of the toric variety will simply be the fan inside MR. And the map will have a tropical analog, which will be a map from this a graph to the fan of our toric variety. So we'll get some kind of tropical curves. And because so about taking moduli spaces and taking dual intersection complex in a nice word should be compatible operation. So it should be true that the most dual intersection complex of the moduli space should be roughly the moduli space of dual intersection complex, meaning the moduli space of tropical curve. So again, in the true geometry, probably nothing like that is true, but in some kind of virtual sense, it is true. And in this correspondence, it's really a dual correspondence. So what will happen will be that 
code immersion case charta of the module space. will produce a dimension K cone in the module space of tropical curves. And so in other words, we'll produce a K dimensional family of tropical curves. So here it's an essential point that this kind of tropicalization I'm describing is not at all a one-to-one -one, uh, correspondence. So more the generic stratum of the moly space, the generic, the more the generic curves correspond to rigid tropical curve, to zero dimensional family of tropical curves. And conversely, the most uh, degenerate curve correspond to families, to maximal families of tropical curves. It's really some uh, dimension reversing uh, operation. Okay, so now if you want to extract numbers out of this moduli space, what we'll do is to consider zero dimensional strata of this moduli space. So in general, this moduli space has dimension d minus two, but it has this kind of nice normal crossing uh, boundary. And you can look to the like most degenerate point to the zero dimensional strata, which somehow really correspond intuitively to the maximally degenerate curves. So they are curves which typically are entirely inside the toric boundary and which are as degenerate as possible. And under such correspondence, such zero dimensional strata correspond to a D minus two dimensional family of uh, tropical curves. Okay, so now the way to extract a number is to fix rho a D minus two dimensional family of tropical curve. In RD, satisfying various uh, conditions, but I will skip. And then you defined a number N rho term of Witten, which is a number of zero dimensional strata in the moduli space with a tropicalization rho. Okay, so roughly the choice of the family of tropical curve is like one choice of combinatorics for the degeneration of your curves. And then for one such a choice of combinatorics, you count how many true geometric curves realize this particular combinatorics choice. So this thing will be the numbers that we're considering. And in general, they're really gromov witten like numbers. Like maybe the And now I can arrive to the uh, main point, which is that in our quiver, a DT story, we had this universal formula reconstructing the DT invariant in terms of the attractor invariance in terms of some coefficient Ft indexed by trees. And this trees was looking something like that. It was starting at a point theta. And then it was continuing and so this picture is living inside the vector space MR. And the things to remark is that given such a tree T, you can naturally produce a D minus two dimensional family of tropical curves. 
So first of all, I can extend this thing to infinity in a straight line if I don't want this point to stop there. And then the point theta, I can move it anywhere inside the upper plane gamma perp. And so I have a D minus one dimensional choices of thetas. But if I move theta along this edge, I do not change the, just the same tropical curve, but with a different point on it. So actually I really get a D minus two dimensional family of tropical curves. And now the main theorem in our paper is that if we fix uh, such a tree, then it's a contribution, this kind of universal coefficient coming from the walk crossing formula is uh, actually equal to these counts of rational curves inside the historic variety whose tropicalization is given by this D minus two dimensional family of tropical curves. So some of the choice of tree correspond to a choice of zero dimensional, like to a choice of combinatorics for the zero dimensional strata inside our big moduli space. And then the coefficient itself is the number of geometric curves of the number of zero dimensional strata, which is given a combinatorial type. Okay, so I will end in uh, two minutes. So just a comment. So really the, the thing which need to be proved is some um, tropical correspondence. Between uh, this kind of degenerate curve and this kind of families of tropical curves. And here something I should point out is that in most uh, traditional uh, tropical correspondence theorem, go, going back to Michalkin on Nishnu Zibert, in these traditional correspondence uh, theorems, you get the correspondence between finitely many uh, algebraic curves and finitely many uh, tropical curves. It's because you are really typically counting curves in a problem where you get zero dimensional moduli spaces and you get a nice one to one correspondence between uh, algebraic object and tropical objects. But here is not really what's happening because here our natural moduli space is really higher dimensional and we are really counting like degenerate strata into this higher dimensional space, which dually correspond to non trivial families of uh, tropical curves. So in particular, we need to do extra work to prove this tropical correspondence and it is what the paper is essentially about. And I would just end by a final a comment about how do these curves look like. So in general, I have a toric variety with some a toric boundary. And the tropicalization of this curve is made of these trees. And I claim that these trees actually move in D minus two dimensional families. But actually it is true for each of the vertices. So actually when your tropical curve moves, each of your vertices move into a D minus two dimensional family. And each vertex of this tropical curve would correspond to a component, irreducible component of your algebraic curve. And the fact that this vertex move in dimension D minus two means because we take the dual intersection complex it means that this component is actually contained into a surface contained into the toric boundary. So we have our, so here's the following picture I want to end with. We have a D-dimensional toric variety, but actually inside the boundary, there is a lot of surfaces. And all the curves that we are counting, they are all made of components living into these surfaces. So in this sense, they are maximally degenerate. They are entirely into the boundary, but even more, they are, on, they are inside very components of very small dimension, like surfaces into the boundary.
And so I will end, but so, so this thing, I, ju I will just end by a speculative comment. So here we are talking about curves in the toric varieties. And we see that some of all the relevant curves really live in some kind of surfaces, living in the boundary. And ideally, we'll do something more complicated, replace toric varieties by more complicated uh, example. And this thing suggests that in the more complicated example, most of the geometry should still be captured by surfaces containing number of crossing compactifications, which is maybe something a bit uh, surprising. Okay, I will stop there. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Uh, are there any questions? By the way, for um, this uh, example of Hitchin systems, or if you like local Calabria or three folds, yes. these uh, toric varieties, what they are, they seem yes. to be sort of formal, formally constructed something, but yeah, so 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 the analog, like in the like in sheet system situation, you really want to have the like the cluster like variety, like the character variety somehow. Uh, yeah, so, you're so, talking so, about toric varieties, not about cluster varieties. So. Yeah, that's right. So this toric variety is just some kind of if you want local local picture, like maybe in general, this cluster variety should have some kind of torus vibration with singularities. And the toric varieties is a picture that you obtain if the singularities are far away somehow. And if you only see the like a smooth torus aberration. So actually, I mean, so so actually the yeah, it's not in our paper, but probably it will be in some next paper where we really consider honest cluster varieties. Which can be described roughly as some kind of blobs of toric varieties. And then you can obtain, a... so the point of this correspondence is that if I want to have an interpretation for this coefficient, ft, this universal coefficients, they are captured by something happening in the toric variety. It's some kind of universal model for like curve coming out, gluing, like coming in, gluing and coming out. It's some kind of local model happening in a smooth torus vibration. But if you want to have the full number, like the full omega dt invariant, and if you assume that the attractor invariants are kind of trivial, like, uh, like your A discriminant assumption, and this thing would just be something like that, then this full combination will be interpreted as some Gram of return invariant of some cluster variety. So this thing is some gram of return invariant of a cluster variety. Uh, but this cluster variety, uh, how, it, how it can be constructed geometrically from your uh, initial torus vibration, whatever is it? Yeah, so. so vibration of complex structure, it's more complicated than. So, so yeah, so it depends in which, so here it is purely like quiver context that just have a combinatorial recipe for, I mean, it's roughly the cluster variety attached to the quiver. Are you asking about the geometric examples? Yeah, uh, or, rather about geometric, yeah. So it's, the quiver, it's a little bit kind of simplified. Quiver. Yeah, that's right. So somebody's the point of this talk, it's simplified enough so that I can, uh, defines this kind of curve and prove a precise correspondence. Yeah, so for things like, uh, yeah, like for a thing like each in system, it's supposed to be something like uh, the character variety, right? Oh, which may be up to some finite cover as some cluster uh, like structure. Hmm. And, and similarly, like for, like, for, like, for, um, like for example, toric Calabria threefold, then you know there will be. I mean, essentially, in this case, there is a quiver. So actually, there is a corresponding cluster, cluster-like uh, variety. Mm, yeah. Yeah. 
but it's not kind of not explicit. You should go through some intermediate steps to see it. So it's yeah, yeah, that, that's also. I mean, hmm. uh, uh, also I have sort of maybe stupid uh, 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 question about the analogy. Yeah, yes. you know, in this uh, original. Uh, Malekhnik Rasov Kunkov. Yes. So this gram of Witten was equal to Donaldson Thomas after some change of variables in pure ge geometric three colloidal. Okay. Yes. Even not necessarily colloidal. Yes. Now, uh, quiver with a potential, it's a three dimensional object. Sometimes yes. it's geometric, sometimes it's not. Should yes. I think about your result as an analog of Grom of Witten to Donaldson Thomas for this uh, 3D Calabial category? So I think the answer is no. Okay, good. So the answer is no. Because, you know, the usual Grom of Witten DT is like on the same threefold, for example. Like a threefold, I mean, both sides are on the same threefold. Yeah, but I think that this... Whereas... Rotical curves can be understood. Ah, so so maybe okay. Let, okay, in the way I present things, the curves are really living in these like higher dimensional varieties. Yeah, 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 yeah. If yeah. they're not in dimension three. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Then it's yeah. I agree. Yeah. In this yeah. directly, it's a stupid analogy, but uh, somehow you can think about this tropical curve as degenerate uh, holomorphic curves inside. Yes. Yeah, so then what? Uh, yeah, that's right. So this thing is uh, maybe speculation. I don't know how to make precise. It's like if from some higher dimensional variety, if you want to reconstruct something like a threefold, then maybe one should look at these kind of surfaces as some kind of low dimensional geometry extracted from this higher dimensional geometry. Can you move your page up because I don't see. Yeah, okay, good. Mm -hmm. But I don't really know how to make. Okay, so, so, so here is a very naive picture. So here you have this kind of holomorphic curve in red. Yeah, again, move it up because yeah, sorry. Uh, I do not see. I do not see what you are writing. Maybe more, even more. Yes, actually, I was not. Ah, okay, good. Writing. I was just pointing to the picture which is on the screen. Ah, so, okay. Yeah, I don't have a point. So, <laughs> so yes, yeah, so on on this picture, there is this red graph, mm -hmm. yeah. which is a uh, holomorphic curve, yeah. which somehow live into this collection of surfaces. Okay. Yeah. And, and if we like to uh, come back to something which looks like a threefold or DT of a threefold, like geometric threefold, you could try to say something, you could try to say that each of these surfaces are some kind of holomorphic symplectic. So actually in these toric geometries are all toric surfaces. So the complement are just C star squared. So it's some kind of, not so interesting, but in more interesting example, this thing should always be some kind of like, like holomorphic symplectic surfaces glued together. And then if there were such a thing as some kind of, I don't know, normal crossing hyperkeller metric, then we could hyperkeller rotate this holomorphic curve into some kind of special Lagrangian inside this kind of broken surface mm -hmm. geometry. And now this thing is extremely close from some honest, let me say dimension two or dimension three uh, setup. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, I understand. So I don't know how to make these various steps precise, but and in particular, I don't understand the connection with like the original, for example, the original quiver, but. Yeah, so I don't know what to say precisely, but I'm saying that like inside this kind of variety, which has some kind of higher dimensional variety, which has some kind of normal crossing compactification, 
if I only look to these kind of surfaces in a boundary, in this the, thing seems to contain a lot of information somehow. Okay. Thank you. Uh, more questions? Uh, yes, I do have a question. So in, in your earlier part, when you were uh, describing the trees uh, with yes. gamma, it decomposed uh, yes. in terms of gamma one up to gamma r. And do you allow those components to be, uh, could be possibly repeating or not? Sorry, to be what? I could not hear you. Say so some of the components could be equal. Uh, equal. Um, mm -hmm. Yes, it's possible, yes. And so here, if uh, what I'm thinking is just uh, look at the quiver, which is the Dinkin uh, quiver for finite dimensional D algebras. Yeah. So just to take simply take uh, each of the gammas to be the, the standard gamma i's, <laughs> the, which takes the value one at each. Um, yes, yes. So in that case, do you have uh, a description of this coefficient? Um, yeah, so I mean, definitely, if you just take your quiver to be in Dinkin. Yeah, let's say uh, like that, that the, in this uh, case it's not, it's known, for example. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. So it's known explicitly what uh, what these numbers are. So actually, it's a it's a very it's a extremely uh, simple case, like finite type situation, mm -hmm. where where you know essentially sees omega bar gamma theta. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Like they can only be, actually they will always be either zero or one, and they will always they, they, they will be only one only, only when the gamma and they will is, be one. Uh, actually, there will be one only if there happens to be a root of the root system. Mm -hmm. So there are only finite number of those. Yeah, that's what. So, so this picture, some of the full picture is really finite. Actually, I like this collection. Yes. And because of the products for corresponding to each one of those um, simple roots, which are not one, uh, uh, which are one based on your acidic, acyclic yes. case. Here's the, the interesting part is to describe the coefficient f. Um, yes, f yeah. Right. Yeah, so. Yeah, that's right. So probably it's a good question. I don't know. So certainly it's possible to figure out probably yeah, in this chamber. So there is always, it is a cyclic situation. There will be some kind of, so there is always some kind of attractor chamber where everything is mostly zero or one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there will be some kind of anti-attractor chamber where things are the most interesting. And definitely yeah, you can ask the question, if I take some root of my root diagram, and you can ask, yeah, explicitly, like for example, what are all these decompositions? What are all the trees? And what are all these exactly numbers? If I, if I take each one of the components to be a root and with some yes. of the roots uh, repeating, so the, yes, the product yes. of the code of those gammas will not be zero. But the, here, the interesting part is to describe the coefficient f, uh, how. Because yeah, and I think this gives a partition of this dimension vector in terms of uh, um, simple roots. How many ways those are given by constant partition functions? Yeah, and I think it's a bit, I don't know the full, I mean, I think the full answer should just be one, actually. Yeah. So I think it should be that probably most of these things are zero, actually. But mm -hmm. I don't know which well, one. Some, some of the coefficients could be negative. Is it possible? Yeah, in principle, has has to be negative because many. I mean, all the all the monomials appear. Those products are all ones. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't know. I think definitely it should be possible to do this. I guess I have not done it. Okay, so I see. It's that. kind of definitely the ADE thing. We know the full. We know mm -hmm. already the full answer. So you can ask what is this virus thing, yeah. and maybe it has a nice. Uh, answer. I don't know about that, but that is a mm -hmm. good question. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, more questions?
actually there, there is one uh, uh, geometric uh, story which I do not see how it's reflected here uh, in this in the example of uh, still hitch in a regular um, system there is a point uh, on the base which is a space of stability uh, conditions uh, in your story uh, where I, I would say all um, vectors uh, transversal to smooth components of the discriminant divisor where they all intersect um, it corresponds in the case of um, SL2 uh, Hitchin integrable system to the uh, quadratic differential same as a spectral curve on the base uh, with all periods to be real, real numbers and uh, to my recollection this point determines everything like whatever you want to compute can be computed in terms of um, this single point on the base like single stability condition and um, these finitely many uh, vectors uh, your story is different it's closer to what we had with maxim because for each gamma you have your own attractor point and your own stability condition and but that story which i i'm talking about is just single yeah stability. but but actually uh, how to say so i think in this geometric story it's really the case where or maybe all the attraction variants are all zero except a few like Basic one uh, I equal to one, maybe. Yes, oh. yes, yes, and, yes, yes. And I think it's true that some of the picture I'm describing this kind of purely quiver or purely toric situation. I think it's exactly the picture we should leave at this point, actually. Mm -hmm. Ah, okay, okay. good. So, okay. so exactly now, at now this I point, okay. you know, yes. you have this kind of maybe rays coming from the discriminant locus. Yeah, 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 yeah. And maybe they all intersect here. Okay. And what I'm describing is really what is happening around this point. Yeah, yeah, maybe you are right. So you have just a single point in the space of stability condition, number of integer vectors, which defines you your fan. And this is a toric variety associated with this uh, special point. Okay. Yes, exactly. And it's related to the fact, maybe it was a bit strange, they well set up the stability parameter in this quiver story I just say theta live inside some upper plane gamma perp mm -hmm. which is maybe a little strange so I think really if you if you write it in terms of like really usual complex value with central charge these locus are exactly it's maybe exactly the locus where maybe up to some convention it's ex maybe exactly the locus where this thing are a real maybe which is exactly yeah, what yeah, you said yeah yeah, yeah i understand that yeah. this okay. condition to have purely real thing are exactly related to this fact that i restrict my stability to live in this upper planes mm -hmm. from point of view okay great good uh, thank you so uh last chance to ask more questions and maybe i can just make a comment really in the local yeah. p2 in the local p2 example uh, we can really see uh yeah, this point is really the orbifold point. And uh, what can really see both the kind of full picture with singularities. And what can really see that, that the picture locally around this point is the same as the picture I've described today for the corresponding quiver. Yeah, yeah, what yeah. I can that's check and see the example that is indeed okay. Exactly the picture which I meant. Yeah, okay. Good. Um, can I ask, so it seemed like we started with a uh, symmetric bilinear form, and then we formed these gamma perps uh, to build a toric fan. And you gave these two-dimensional examples. It's symmetric, probably. Oh, uh, yes. oh. Uh, I just remembered it was like a, it was a two form. The, the initial form is something like a ring or whatever. You, you symmetrize your initial Ah, okay. I was going to ask, uh, in, in the fan, you said the setup was sort of invariant under refining, under refinements of the fan, 
And I was uh, I was going to ask if in particular, given a ray of the fan, if we add in like minus of that ray, will that change the setup? Oh, yeah, maybe I can briefly comment about that. So in the, in the way of setup things, uh, this is kind of choice of a fan, which is related to a choice. Yeah, it's like really how do you, which compactification of your toric variety do you take? And you know, if you take a, if you refine your fan, it just means do a toric blow up of your toric variety. And it's some kind of theorem, it's some kind of nice property of this log gram of width invariant that they're somehow invariant under this kind of modification of the boundary. So, so yes, so somehow, yeah, the thing which is essential is like the torus inside C star to the D. This particular boundary divisor di, and then whatever other whatever other things you add, you have some choices, but these choices will be irrelevant at the end. They all give the same answer, which is maybe related to the maybe intuitive fact that maybe these things are trying to count. Maybe from a symplectic point of view, maybe there are really some kind of open I don't know holomorphic curve living in the interior of the toric variety. And in some limit, they become this algebraic curve living into the boundary. But if you believe that they come from something in the interior, the count should not depend on what you put at the boundary. So actually what you are counting live at the boundary, but the answer is actually invariant under like toric modification of the boundary. Okay, thanks. More questions? Uh, well, if there are no more questions, so thank you very much. And may I ask you to, to email yes. me your notes? Yes, I will send you the notes. Yes, I will mm -hmm. do that. Great. Okay, thank you. And this is it for uh, today.